I'm Tarn Adams, also a co-founder of Bay 12 Games. We made Dwarf Fortress. That's right. It'll probably be blurry, but that's fine, I guess. I noticed the PDF was pretty blurry. Great. Do you want this clicker? Uh, yeah. yeah. Or this is uh, oh, this is his mic. Have you got your mic? Hey, we'll come up on stage. Yep. Great. Anyway, big round of applause. Uh, hello. Hi, I'm Zach Adams, the co-founder of Bay 12 Games and co-creator of Dwarf Fortress. And I'd like to share my our childhood inspirations of Dwarf Fortress or for Dwarf Fortress to the roguelike inspirations and then Tarn's gonna describe more of how that came into reality. So, this is Rogue. It came out when I was five years old, and back then I was just learning how to write basic. My dad was teaching me from the back of magazines. We would type in the, the code together, and it was only a few years later when we were able to, me and Tarn were able to download uh, roguelike games from, um, bulletin board systems. And our favorites were Hack, Moria, and Larn, and Rogue, of course. But of all of them, Hack, we were able to get pretty far down in the dungeon. Moria, we were able to flesh out the monster memory. And Larn were, was the easier of the games, and we were able to get really high levels, which was different for us, because we sucked at these games. And, but Rogue was always the hardest, and we always, we'd always get killed on level one by an emu or a kestrel or something. So in our, uh, in our um, specifications or, or feature, our feature list of Dwarf Fortress, we joked at the bottom that we include 16 colors, including black, and eight background colors, including black, with the ASCII character set. And even though that's a joke, we like to think what would happen if the uh, game industry never advanced beyond that. Like, what would they what would they have to deal with? And we think it would, it would be the, the kind of things that make roguelikes great is what would be out there, and that's what we tried to do. Now, roguelikes, um, let's see. So, after he gave up on games like King's Quest and Ultima that came out around the same time, or, or won them, it's like going back and playing them, it, it didn't make sense because you knew what was gonna happen. There's no, I mean, you could speed run King's Quest or something, but what would that even mean? So the roguelikes were the answer to that because of procedural generation. And it's it, the, the treasures and, and enemies and, and, uh, and the dungeon were different every time, every time you played. And um, so uh, we kept playing these games. Like Rogue, we played until the five and a quarter inch disc that it came on didn't work on our computer anymore. So the other thing that made roguelikes great was permadeath and a high score list. And of course, elevator action. We, me and Tarn grew up in the age of the pizza arcade where we would endlessly sink tokens into games like elevator action and Pac-Man. But we treated roguelikes the same way. And this is a roguelike of Pac-Man we found. <laughs> and at home, we would compete against each other just like we would be competing in Chuck E. Cheese for the highest level on the high score list. But roguelikes were different because you have to name your character before you play. And so naturally, we would get so pissed off by losing over and over again in hack or something that we'd get really far down and then I don't realize that we named ourselves something obscene and then get the top of the high score list. <laughs> so quickly, we had to learn how to hack the high score list and put our own names back in there. <laughs> so now this is hack, hack 103. And hack went further beyond the high score list because it would actually save what was called a bones file, and this was really revolutionary for us because it was like, it would save the it would save the entire level. We didn't know that at the time, but it saved your where your body was and your items, so you could come back and rescue them. And it's like this, this um, 
this is kind of what inspired Dwarf Fortress's legend mode because it saved what creature killed you. And if you name the creature in, net, in, net, in hack, it would come back in, uh, if, you, if you, you'd have to name it first, you have to realize it's gonna kill you. It's gonna kill you and then name it. And then you could go back and get revenge because you could find the named creature back in the bones file. So, and the, there really hasn't been anything like this until Shadow of Mordor, I was thinking, because it's like the, the same orc would kill you over and over again. And then you'd eventually get revenge. And, and that was like 30 years after the fact. There hasn't really been anything like, the, like that for bones files. So this one is Moria, and Moria, the, their, their way of persisting through, through character deaths was through the monster memory, and that was our favorite part of Moria. It would tell you, like, if, if you were hit by a creature, it would tell you, the monster memory would tell you later when you, when you looked it up on your next game how much it could hit for or what special abilities they had. And uh, so for this, it's like, it inspired in us the, the raw files for Dwarf Fortress, like all the statistics and stuff we put in text files that you can change. But it's more like when we were playing Moria, like exploring a strange planet or something like that, finding all these different animals. And it reminded us of Starflight, which is a contemporary game, which is a big inspiration for Dwarf Fortress. Because there's like 800 planets and you could find all these animals with different attributes and stuff like that. And that was another big inspiration along with Moria. Now this is Larn. I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Larn. It came out, uh, I think, when I was nine years old, and it was like the other roguelikes. But you could—it was relatively easy to become a god. You could, at the highest levels, like at this—it says evil master. You become like a god of earth, and then a good master, and then an evil master. And it would like let you to walk through walls and cast the sphere of annihilation and destroy all the demons. And it wasn't until after that that the roguelike Ragnarok came out. And Ragnarok, it was like the, the last levels of Ragnarok, you would be able to transform into any creature, cast the highest level spells, and fight with the gods at the end of time on the river Bryfrost. And so this is an inspiration for us because this is what we want. This is the future of Dwarf Fortress. We want the, to be able to change things at the highest level and be equal to the gods. It's something that we never did when we were playing Dungeons and Dragons. We never got past the first couple levels because we, when we played Dungeons and Dragons with each other, it was like playing rogue, it was like you die on level two every time. <laughs> so we always wanted to do this, so eventually this is where we're going to go. So I'm going to give it over to Tarn, he's going to talk about how this came into being. Yeah, so, um, oh, okay, so uh, we've been, uh, let's see, I'll just stand here, it seems safer, right? So we've been, we've been writing uh, games as long as we've been playing them. I don't remember a time I couldn't program basic. Uh, I learned to read at the same time. Uh, my father was really serious about computer education, but <laughs> he, <laughs> he regrets now getting us into it using games. It was probably the right approach, but now we make games and we don't. <laughs> <laughs> really do anything else with it. But this is, uh, we wrote this in, uh, in BASIC. Uh, this was in elementary school. This is the, the oldest screenshot we could find of a surviving game. This is Drag Slay, the BASIC version. It's basically just text that scrolls down the screen um, and you're fighting monsters and so forth. And at this time, we were playing games like Rogue and Hack, but we didn't have a clue how to, how to actually do a pathfinding algorithm or vision algorithm. And it was very hard, you know, especially before the internet uh, was just accessible at your fingertips, and we wouldn't know to search for pathfinding anyway, right? We were little kids. And uh, so we ended up making a lot of games. Uh, you can hardly see these things. This is a strategy, wizard-based game. You choose your, your goal in the beginning of the game, like bathing the world in flame or just protecting people or whatever. Uh, we have this, this planetary exploration game. Uh, we had arcade games. This is a, a, a pixel-based arcade game, all randomly generated wiring and everything. We wrote this around 96. Uh, pixel pieces blow off the textures and everything. This is right when uh, 3D textures became popular and you can actually learn in a book how to do them. We made little 2D texture games. Uh, but we never made a roguelike. Um, but that's not to say that the roguelike games didn't inspire a lot of what we were doing even back then. Uh, it's hard to read the darker text, but this is a score, a score list from the C version of Drag Slay. This is from uh, 93 to 97, say, when we were in high school. And uh, 
all of our roguelike inspirations that we could do, um, not pathfinding or anything like that, but persistence, uh, find itself uh, here. You can see at the top that you were killed by a skilled bugbear, and down below you were killed by novice creatures and so forth. You could get negative points if you committed crimes, but uh, basically um, just the same kind of scrolling fighting game, but it saved all of those creatures. If, if one of them killed you, it could yell your name back at you, just like in Dwarf Fortress. Uh, and they had uh, persistent, again, no, the horrible, horrible shot here, but that's, that's the debug readout for a persistent tribe in this game. This, this is some kind of giant tadpole creatures. Uh, and there were 67 of them in the tribe. The, 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 uh, the levels are listed there. They created items. After you lose the game, it would dump all this information about them. You can read the part at the bottom where the tribe splinters into an additional, um, uh, who, who's the, what's it? <laughs> And uh, and the the uh, the the uh, so so we we had a lot of this information and they they remembered certain things, but we didn't think of it and we kind of thought of it how how we thought about bones levels because like like Zach said the most important thing was what killed you and what it was called not really the layout of the level we didn't think about that too much, um, but as we went on. All of our kind of game inspirations, Starflight, Ultima, gelled with these roguelike inspirations, and we started doing thinking about persistent worlds. Uh, you know, so we have this game, uh, such as it is. The 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 we we were also kind of um, still young and struggling with a kind of. What's the, we had so many gr dead projects in our graveyard, hundreds of dead projects, and never we released maybe one game. Uh, and uh, before this time. And so we had this horrible philosophy that it, that it would need to be built from the bottom up. I mean, there's something to be said for starting with your basic structures and kind of finding the gameplay from there. But we had such a large idea of what that game would be that all we did was just build basic data structures. And uh, this game knew all of the tissues in your body. It knew how curly the hair on your arm was. You could set any set of stance points, your feet and your hands, and would procedurally generate animations uh, for them. Terrible animations. Here's, here's a cat person standing on their hands, and there's their <laughs> tail sticking up there. And you could just walk around on your hands and so forth. Uh, it, it updated all the textures. If you lost your eye, it would be removed. If the skin was stripped off one of your limbs with one of our horrible spells, it would show little muscles and stuff underneath. Disgusting game. But... Uh, it was... It, 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 and it never became a game at all. It, it was... Um, we were still kind of struggling to find uh, sort of um, the, the right way to, to make games. Uh, and we had a lot of side projects at that time on the website. I uh, may have heard of World War I Medic or Liberal Crime Squad. Those are on, the, on our web page. And we also started working on this game called Mutant Miner. I finally found a screenshot of it. And uh, this one was going to be just another side project where you dig down into this kind of dig dug style level down and it's, it's ASCII graphics, you find little creatures down there, you also find uh, minerals to bring back, and you find vats of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle mutagen to bathe yourself in, to grow extra arms and so forth, to help you out in your uh, endeavor. And as usual, the thing was not scoped very well, so we're like, well, you need multiple miners and so forth, and it became this horrible turn, I don't know if you ever played the Gold Box games with these interminable 50-person orc fights and so forth. It became like a version of that where you weren't even fighting anything most of the time. So you're just like, click, 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 click. We didn't think about the interface at all, and so we had a little sit down and talked about it for a few days. I remember these kind of four hour phone calls Zach and I would have trying to, to piece together what eventually became uh, Dwarf Fortress. Uh, we had this idea for a side project now where we made it real time so to completely alleviate all of these problems we were having with the mining colony uh, and uh, switched over to a fantasy game, just felt comfortable. Who mines? Dwarves mine. Who mines in a little colony? Dwarves do that, and they get treasures and stuff. So, we, and we're also, of course, totally into our whole Armok idea and persistence, all these kind of roguelike um, bones file ideas. So you, you make a fort, you lose the fort, it gets saved, you play a roguelike game in the ruin, uh, the fort establishes a maximum score, the roguelike game, you kind of fill up the gas tank to get a final score. When you get tired of it, you restart the game. Uh, it's a simple loop, but it was, it was going to be an interesting two-month project. That, uh, <laughs> and uh, it turned out that when you're programming in ASCII uh, with text graphics and you're not working on a 3D game, all of your ideas get done so much more quickly, and Dwarf Fortress just steals everything from Armok and becomes 
our persistent world game, right? So here's the, um, the basic uh, schematic of, of how Dwarf Fortress works. You generate a world. There it is. Uh, the world can run by itself uh, as of recently. There, there's some AI stuff that goes on there. You lose a fort. It's like losing a net hack adventure. They die, get added to the world. You play an adventure, you lose. It gets added to the world. And, I mean, it's, it's like um, one of these talks was speaking about, I think it was the rogue people speaking about kind of rehabilitating permadeath as not just a bad thing. Uh, that's what our losing is fun motto comes from. Uh, permadeath is the entire engine that runs the game. Uh, and you can just start and keep playing as long as something persists. Like we, we're obsessed with these score lists, right? Uh, as long as something persists, uh, it's not lost. And you can continue playing in the uh, world as long as you like. I mean, we haven't played up those interactions very much, but uh, we try our best. Uh, even at some point, we decided losing, who cares? Uh, you, sometimes people get tired of a game. Sometimes people want to play a different part of the game. Just let them retire. Uh, you could always retire your adventures. It was harder to retire a fort, still buggy. But you can just retire an adventure, um, start up a fort. Your adventure might come to visit it. They're AI controlled now. You retire the fort, restart the adventure, move to a different fort, unretire that fort, watch your adventure run around and meet your old adventurers and so forth. Uh, you can just kind of assume roles for a while and then um, uh, carry on from there. Uh, and we have the legends mode down there, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in a bit. So here's, just for people who haven't seen it, I thought I should, you know, this is not a graphical game. It looks like this instead. You guys are happy with that here, but um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is what we've got, right? Uh, there's little dwarves, little happy faces in the center. Uh, we have some rooms up in the top left, bedrooms. There's a stone stockpile in the bottom left. Uh, workshops at the bottom, uh, booze stockpile up top, and then a hill dropping off to the right. One of the most confusing things about the game now is that you can kind of see in these cross sections. Um, it's very difficult to play. Uh, people have made kind of isometric viewers to help out a bit with that. Uh, but it's still kind of a mess. Uh, here's adventure mode. Uh, this is the traveling around part in adventure mode. At the You see the kind of iconic at in the center. That's where you are. And there's a river. There's a couple villages at the bottom, a little castle. I mean, a couple of villages at the top and a, a castle down at the bottom. Um, and it plays, I mean, it's, it's kind of aimless, but it plays more or less like a traditional roguelike wandering around a giant world, uh, finding things to do. And we have the Legends mode, which is really just a set of events. You can kind of categorize and, and look for different things, but uh, really just says everything that's happened. And your own exploits just get saved right into this, and you can see kind of where you fit in. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, treat it like a, like a score list ourselves. And there's, there's a lot of analogs to, to roguelikes here. Uh, our world generation is, is, you know, we think of that as like a roguelike generation. We have, uh, for us, we just want to build a whole world. So we use elevation temperature, rainfall, drainage to put them together, make a bio map, run a history on it. You get this kind of weird historical map. And the thing you can't see there is just that same map in ASCII. And you, you've probably seen those drifting around the, the, uh, the Dwarf Fortress ASCII world maps. Um, but the, the analogs, as we've been talking about, don't end there. The world might be like the bones level, but the legends, we really do think of it as a high score list. It doesn't, it doesn't um, operate in the same way where you like maybe compete with each other or whatever, but the, the legends for us was more a uh, kind of um, sort of memory we could share with each other of our exploits and, uh, or just to kind of have fun with each other. We have um, in... Uh, <laughs> In these kind of hack games, when you die, it, it tells you a sentence with a name in it, usually your name in a net hack and hack, uh, you could name your creature that kills you, and uh, it would also be preserved on this list. And, and that is the seed of a Dwarf Fortress legend, that, that sentence that you see there with the date and uh, everything that, that happened like that. It was really kind of a beginning of this whole sort of narrative experience for us. Uh, we have um, other uh, things that we got uh, out of, out of, out of uh, roguelikes um, to kind of um, build these narratives are this, this whole idea that every creature in the game is playing by the same rules. Uh, here we have our uh, partial, uh, we, we picked the Kestrel and the Emu, of course, but uh, such bad memories, but the but the, uh, the they they uh, they are just like a dwarf or a human will have a very similar definition. When you play, you're playing a creature file. Everyone plays by the same rules. There's this whole idea of verisimilitude, however you pronounce that, where even if it's not Earth, things play by a consistent set of rules that you can kind of understand. Uh, the um, 
like it was, it was kind of like uh, the 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 talk that was in this room uh, last about wit being able to kind of see what's going to happen, uh, and that helps you build a narrative. And that's kind of how we think about uh, roguelike games as sort of narrative generators. And if it's all under the same umbrella, it's easier for those those narratives to come alive. Uh, we have. Uh, other roguelike conventions I just thought I'd throw up here. Uh, we use a lot of the same symbols. This is all just, a, just an homage to the, uh, to the roguelikes that, that start us off. We have our demons and dragons. We even have the, uh, the Epic's version of Rogue. I mean, we're one of the few people to actually purchase it in, at the box store, right? Uh, uh, our dwarf carpenter looks exactly like the little yellow happy face that was moving around on the DOS version. Of course, we use all the same lighting kind of um, uh, uh, methods and uh, saving the map that you've seen before. Uh, even even uh, Adam, the, the herbs you might be able to see here, the little quotes, you know, that grow by the Conway's uh, life rules you might, you might be familiar with from that game. The quote is such a perfect, a perfect symbol for this because you have, in Dwarf Fortress especially, you have these, these periods and commas and apostrophes making up kind of the grass and you want to make it thicker and you want to make it taller. <laughs> And that's a quote, right? <laughs> so it's, it, was, it was the perfect symbol for us. Um, but also we took engravings. Uh, this is a, a hack thing uh, you, you probably know about. Um, for us, it was the first visual art that dwarves could, could do. Um, and it's because it was in, in hack. Uh, there's, uh, the, of course, the Elbereth engraving, right? It's, I guess it's mentioned in the manual. We always thought of it as cheating, and so we never got very far in NetHack at all, right? Because uh, it would it would protect you. But we always thought, oh, it's so out of character. You know, why would a tourist or a caveman who or whoever you might be playing know this? And so it was disallowed. No Elbereth in our games. Uh, we had we had a number of <laughs> strange rules uh, regarding engravings. Yeah, if you had a fire wand. Right, fire wand's very useful. Right, you can you can you can kill things with it, especially. Uh, but if you if you knew how many charges you were had and you're down to one charge, you couldn't use it to save your life. It had to be used to write something funny on the ground, <laughs> <laughs> like something permanent that the next person could see when they played your bones level. Right, uh, it's just how we how we, we had we had such a strange uh, experience with these games, but. Uh, the uh, it, 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 but but these little these little interlocking mechanisms right that's that's what make that's what make narratives work uh, for us we've just we've just run with it uh, in in uh, in in hack you might have a uh, a uh, a wand bounce off a wall and polymorph something and then you can quick read a genocide scroll or whatever to catch it right at that time all this kind of all this kind of thing and we 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 have something similar this was a uh, a recent bug report, uh, which was pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty complicated to figure out. Uh, we had the we just added tavern uh, taverns to to the fortress mode with the dwarves running around. We suddenly get a bug report with well, their cats vomiting all over the floor, <laughs> and we're just like, okay, you know, it's detective time. What what on earth is going on? And the community helped us, you know, figure this one out. Uh, we have the we have the dwarf. They're serving the beverage. Uh, they retrieve the mug filled with alcohol, give it to the dwarf. The dwarf suddenly has another job to do, and so they're like, oh, I need to free my hands for this one, pitch it over their shoulder. There goes the alcohol spilled all over the ground. Now, cats are always like, I want to be with the people I like, uh, wandering around. Sometimes they go catch vermin, but they'll wander into the tavern to be with people. And it gets its little paws all over in the alcohol there. And uh, we had just added, when we added eyelids that, that don't ask why, we added eyelids that, <laughs> that, that clean, clean the, uh, the, the contaminants off of your eyes, we were like, well, oh, let's add a few other things so cats could lick to clean themselves. And uh, so th the cat detected that it had a contaminant on its paw, it cleaned itself, but we were, you know, we were like, well, if you clean yourself with uh, you know, an ingesting type part, then go ahead and trigger the ingestion syndrome. But the, the kind of the whole, the only bug in this whole scenario was that the ingestion syndrome had the default amount. So it was just like the cat was throwing back a whole mug. <laughs> And we had, of course, we had all the body mass stuff in there, and the cat just got sick. There were some deaths. It was terrible. <laughs> and, but it was just, uh, you know, this is a story, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is interlocking mechanisms give rise to, to this kind of thing. And it's kind of our, our whole philosophy that came out of playing roguelike games. Um, and we've kind of taken it, uh, tried to stretch the boundary of what we could do with it. Um, there's this whole idea in roguelikes you might hear floating around about them being non-modal, uh, trying to reduce down to a, a single play mode uh, so that um, 
uh, you, you're not pulled out of the, the action uh, and you don't go to like a special shop screen or something like that. I mean, sometimes you do. Of course, there are all kinds of exceptions. But if, if, if possible, try and keep it all on one screen. And that's, that's kind of a general uh, interface um, you know, philosophy. Uh, not that you should take any interface advice from me. But uh, it's uh, <laughs> for us, uh, we tried to do it with conversations even. Here we have a, a goblin speaking and then another action, which you probably can't read, uh, happening afterward. And the conversations actually exist as a, uh, as a structure in the game. And you have an utterance builder. We didn't know how to get around that to make that a not a screen. You have to kind of say what you want to say. But then it's floated out there to who you're talking to. And they can do other things while they, resp while they respond back. And this can, this can facilitate behaviors like robberies and so forth that have some back and forth. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing you might you, you see in AAA games all the time when someone's running down the street screaming or whatever. But you still don't actually, when you go to talk to people, it still pops up a radial menu or something, right? So it's, it's it's still experimental, but it's kind of um, just another uh, application of this kind of roguelike uh, philosophy that we were uh, kind of uh, brought up with. And uh, finally, Zach brought up uh, Larn and uh, Ragnarok, right, and as, as kind of the future of Dwarf Fortress. And of course, there, there are all kinds of other inspirations uh, that work into this, but we never... I mean, the first time we experienced it was with Larn, with these characters that could suddenly walk through walls and so forth. And so we have... Uh, upcoming in Dwarf Fortress, not for the next release, but for the one after that, uh, the sort of myth and magic system generator. We want to just let it go nuts. So this one here has a dwarves that carve these fate rune stones out of uh, who knows what. Uh, they're created by carving a very rare stone under the stars. OK. And so you'd actually have to do that if you wanted to make one. And they concentrate on the timeless judgment, which is one of these weird forces on the right. The whole mythology is generated. Uh, there's a, you can find a talk online. I did it at GDC. It's free. It's not, not locked away in the vault where you can just watch me going through one of these. But uh, uh, that's, that's where we're, we're hoping to, to take it and finally kind of have the, the culmination of all of these uh, things we've been, we've been working on. This will be, certainly be a peak anyway. Um, but um, yeah, that's really all I, I have to say. Uh, I don't know how much time there is left, but we'll take questions. Okay.